Hi everyone. First thing first, thanks for joining us today for another Australian food mechanics seminar. This is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Professor Liza Jendi from uh, Newcastle University. He finished his PhD at IMST at France, then he was a postdoc at Cambridge, and then he moved to Newcastle in 1991, Australia. And his research interest is in, uh, in turbulence, encompass experimental and numerical theoretical world of turbulence boundary layer, turbulence channel flow, jet and wake flows, and the small scale turbulence. And today is, is going to give us a very interesting talk on a small scale turbulence phenomena. Could have we got it wrong? With this, I hand it over to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the introduction. All right, uh, as the chairman said, I'm going to talk about small scale turbulence. And, and the title is just to, to illustrate what we, we've been thinking over the, the past years uh, with the new results we have. So we have some questions here to, to address, and I'll try to address the sort of questions here. First, let me introduce the, the, the collaborator I'm working with and with all collective work led to this seminar here. So first with Professor Bob Antonia from Newcastle here, then Shuling Tang from uh, Shenzhen, China, Lumineta Danaila from, from France, and Wang Zhou from also Shenzhen, also recently with Marcello Meldi from University of Poitiers. So let me first start for, with the motivation here <coughs> about the to the presentation here. First, when we talk about small scale turbulence, we really think in terms of, of uh, the theory and, and of the theory about the, for the small scale turbulence, really there are basically, uh, I don't know if I should say two or one theory, but there is one guy who developed an interesting theory, which is called Mogorov's, <laughs> and he developed a, in the 40, in the 40 or 41s, this similarity law for the, what we call the, structure velocity and where delta u is the velocity increment and he came up with some nice dimensional analysis and so on analysis of phenomenology with that the the, the moment of the second the structure function here behave in this form however shortly after he introduced this similarity law here, there was a remark by by londo i mentioned we'll talk about this later on which um, suggested that there must be some some flaw in this <laughs> analysis and then Kolmogorov tried to correct for that remark. And he came up with a, what we call the refined similarity law in this form here. <coughs> and you can see the difference between these two here. <coughs> and the Paolo exponent are quite di differs from that one here, except for the exponent one, uh, exponent three, or zeta three, where we we'll see that zeta three must be equal to one. Now the question here, of course, is each, which one is correct? Is it 41 or, or K62? We can see that there is a 1961, but 1961, because this is when Kolmogorov presented his, his, uh, this, his similar, new refined similarity law conference in Marseille. Now, of course, some might want to ask, is it important to know about either K41 or K62? Where well, Kreshman probably answer this, this question here. <coughs> where he says that really normally K62 doesn't need the concept of, of either third <laughs> or the third Kolmogorov hypothesis. That hypothesis is but assuming that what we call the uh, locally average dissipation behaves in the log normal form. I'll mention this later on. And also probably he says that we don't need the universality of the scales. But more importantly is that once we abandon the K41 theory, then we open a Pandora box of possibility. So basically we have many options. For example, the 1961 theory is, an op is one possibility among the many. So really it's very important to, to, to address these two here and figure out which one is okay. And also Xi'an here uh, mentioned that either K, if you consider K41 or K62, these are two really different theories. And then they don't, they don't describe the small scale turbulence similarly. And, <clears throat> and also it is important to know because if in terms of predictions, it, it, you really want to know 
which theory is correct. And if you want to predict <laughs> different phenomena that where the small scale are important, you probably would, you would like to know what is the, the correct theories. So that's for the, the motivation of the work here. <clears throat> now, what, what happened between K41 and K62? In fact, they share a common feature. We'll see later on if this feature may, might not in fact be <laughs> common, but they share that this relation here, where the third order structure function behaves like uh, my, minus four fifth uh, epsilon I would call this a four fifth law. <laughs> this is really a rigorous result, which is derived from the equation. Kolmogorov first derived it. He started with the, what we call a kalman Howard equation in the expressed in terms of um, structure functions. And he simply stated that if you have a, a range of scales <clears throat> where you can neglect the viscous term, and you can neglect this term, which this term refers to the large scales. Basically, this equation is, is the, the energy budget at different scales of motions. So if you neglect the large scales contribution and the, dis, the, diff, the, the effect of viscosity here, then you end up with this basic law here, which is a rigorous result, <laughs> and which is an interesting find. But one thing here is that it is impossible to test practically because you have to neglect the large scales <laughs> uh, motions and in turbulence the large scales motions are always there so it's very difficult to, to test this theory now what we can do well, at least when i say test by through experiment or even through, through the dns data it's difficult so what we, we thought we can do we said let's assume that we have this four fifth law here okay we've got this uh, verified and let's assume that we can also have an expression for delta <laughs> the, the, the order the the structure functions of order n represented by this expression at this stage we don't know what's the exponent of the the power law here but let's assume we've got this relationship uh, valid so what what we can do is to determine now what are some constraints mathematical constraints whose exponent should verify so the exponents are realizable or if you prefer the, the formula you have is uh, realistic and it's realizable okay so we've done this actually and then we we used what we call the the older inequality here and the cauchy schwartz <laughs> inequality here to this relation and we found out that the exponent or the even exponent should behave in this form here where the exponent of the second order structure function has to be less than two thirds okay so this is what comes come up from from the from some of those constraints those are powerful constraint but unfortunately or fortunately depending where you sit on on either you are pro or against k41 this relation invalidate what we know about the current estimates of these this exponent implicitly if this uh, even order exponent are incorrect. You know that also the odd <laughs> uh, exponent are incorrect. Interestingly, the K41 prediction fits with nicely with that one. Okay, so this these results here raises some questions, particularly on the small scale turbulence phenomenology and how we come about to to, to this this sort of status quo between K41 and, and K41, K62. And <laughs> there's a sort of question here, which, which I raised, or I raised, is that did we get it wrong? So did, did we do something wrong in, in, in the analysis? If so, we must have missed something. And what we have missed? And how could we have missed the information that probably led us to the wrong track? If we are done with this, then what can we do? So this, this seminar here is aimed at try to address this, this, uh, these questions here. So I'll start, I think the best way to start is start from where it all began is with Londo remarks <coughs> regarding the Kolmogorov uh, similarity law. Now, I remind you that Col Londo remark concerns the, the two third law where I just write it here if you want that <coughs> delta U square behave like epsilon r two-thirds okay 
epsilon r. Oh, I, I put a bar to say we're dealing with, with an ensemble averaging. So what, what Landau says is basically this law here <laughs> might work instantaneously, but on average it does not work because this term here is subjected to oscillation of periods of last, well, or the period of the last 80s. This is interesting, this, this, this sentence is interesting, at least for me, is because Landau, I think when we read this, refers to the effect of the large scales on the dissipations. Okay. And because different turbulent flow have different large scales motion, then it says that you cannot achieve universality. So it seems to me that Lando was talking about the effect of large scales on the dissipation. And in that <laughs> sense, you might, have no, you, don't, you might not reach universality as long as you have large scales. Now, having said that, then, then Two correction or two, two, two personal, two researchers, and this Obukov and Kolmogorov try to address this, this remark. Obukov, I don't think he addressed it directly, but he came up with a nice <coughs> sort of solution. Obukov was working in the atmospheric flow, so his, he was dealing with very large with boundary layers with very, very large, large scales. And he, he knew that there is a big, big oscillations. <laughs> Of large scale oscillation in his results, and he knew it could not take an infinite long time to take an average. So he came up with this new sort of epsilon, which is a local average energy dissipation defined under this formula. Now, if you take an ensemble, you end up with a epsilon r bar equal to epsilon. Now, Kolmogorov followed Obukov in that in that sense that he used this expression for epsilon r and like obukov he assumed that this epsilon r follows the log normality distribution both came up with a sort i don't know if we can call this a correction but they come up with this expression for the second order structure function where we recognize the truth of law. and there is a, a function here i call it correction just for the simplification here <laughs> where for obukov that function is given by this relation here. Now you can see by, if you use this relation here into here, you cannot express delta square in terms of a power law. Maybe this is, that, 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 that reminds us what uh, Krishna said, we might not need a power law <laughs> in the, <laughs> to satisfy the, the small scale. However, if we look at K62, the expression for big F is given by this relation here. And indeed, if you substitute this expression into the, that one here, then you can express, of course, delta U square in terms of a power law. Trouble with that one here, again, if I use, if you use that one here, and if we have to satisfy the mathematical constraint on epsilon Z, which can be expressed in that term, then alpha 2E has to be negative which is not what we have so far. But anyway, this is the constraint that would, is, should be imposed on alpha two <laughs> if we assume K62. Now, it is unfortunate really that, that the, the, the correction proposed by Obukov was not tested. Worse than that, it was forgotten for some reason. I don't know why, but it was forgotten. So what happened then? K 62 was embraced and eventually it followed. And we assume that then we, <laughs> we accepted that this, the, the end order moment of the structure function behave in this form. <clears throat> Where of course, because of the four-field flow, <laughs> we must have epsilon three or zeta, sorry, zeta three equals to one, it has to. One thing I want to mention here that is Kolmogorov, when he developed his refined similarity and when he wrote, wrote this, he didn't write it for this expression, but he did it for the absolute value. Now, why the absolute value was dropped, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, but it was really meant for the absolute value. Anyway, taking this one here, so many attempts has been done to develop models to calculate the Paolo exponent zeta n. Some, after some attempt, it, 
becomes apparently clear that the log normal distribution of epsilon has to be abandoned because he was not predicting prop behavior of the, the or he was giving an unrealistic result for the, some high order exponent. So new approach has been <laughs> had to be developed and I can refer to Frisch where there is a <laughs> detailed examples of uh, models. So mainly two models have been developed. One based on the velocity, intermittency of the velocity and one in, based on the intermittency of the dissipation. Now, when I say intermittency, I'm referring to the, what we call internal intermittency or small scale intermittency. Now, if you remember Lando, Lando remarks, to me, seem to refer to the large scales intermittency, the oscillations. Now, how we went from the large scales intermittency to the internal or small scale intermediation. Again, it's a mystery to me, but this is how it worked, and <laughs> we end up with this one. With these models here, the current model now for describing the exponent zeta n are based on what we call a metrifractal phenomenology. And <laughs> seem they, they, <laughs> they seem to follow this law. Here. And I, I showed this picture from Anselme and all from 1984 because it, it really. So, seems to have marked, you know, or confirmation of Kolmogorov K62. So this straight line here corresponds to Kolmogorov 41, where the Paolo exponent uh, Z, <coughs> ZIN followed the N on 3. In this one here, as you can see we have some deviation here. So that really was an exciting time and a lot of people then started to try to understand what's going on. But this paper, is quite uh, well cited for this really reason that it really seems to confirm that there is a problem with the K41. And I don't mention here, but there's a lot of, I was talking with Bob explaining that there's a lot of work done to achieve those high, we're talking about a high or the moment. Here, so you can imagine the signals were too long. But anyway, this is, this is an important <coughs> result here. And <coughs> as the year passed, it seems to have been reproduced <clears throat> by the DNS data here and also by uh, some model by Shea and Liebke. I, I plotted the line here, which is what we call the beta model, initially developed by Frisch, but also abandoned because it didn't reproduce this, this behavior. Now, that's, that's fine, but again, I'm, I'm, I've got a problem because of this. Those exponents here do not obey those constraint. So something is, 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 is not working here. Although someone might figure out something is here. You can see here, remember for the order three, zeta three has to be one. It seems that they've got one. So let me increase this <laughs> one here. So if we put the concentration here, we say, oh, hang on, we have got that uh, zeta three is equal to one. So it seems that with the, the, the four fifth law is, is apparently valid. Well, unfortunately, and I encourage you to, to, to read the, the paper here, the actual data do not show this, do not that one. What happened here, this value appeared to be assumed valid. Now, uh, and as I said, in this paper, a lot of scrutiny was went into there, and we, it is shown that there's the value of delta u cube does not approach <laughs> the fourth fifth law. So, and there's no plateau which would suggest, <clears throat> if, I, if, I, if you bear with me here, and you, you write eps, <laughs> delta u cube over epsilon r, so if we have a, this value in that epsilon r, that value should be 0.8, so your data should sit here. I have, of course, there is a start to increase and then drop. But you should have a plateau here around 0.8. So far, none of the existing data, either DNS or experiment, show this, show this result. So really, again, this has to be questioned. <clears throat> now, what can be the cause of that? I guess all those estimates here, zeta n, have been obtained in finite Reynolds number flow, where the, the, the large scales are not negligible and might affect the small scale. <laughs> turbulence. And also we have to recall that 
finite Reynolds number effect, okay, the effect of large scales on the, on the small scale, at least in the scaling range, has been demonstrated in the, around 2000s, you know, by Boratini, <coughs> Antonio Boratini. All of those effects have been known a bit earlier, particularly by by Xi and he, so perhaps this you really encourage you to read this uh, review about Xi who worked quite extensively in showing that the what we call the deviation of the two third law or the abnormal behavior of the exponent is more associated with the finite Reynolds and the effect than the, and the intermittency. Anyway, that leads me to say, like like the log normality of epsilon here has been to be abandoned, well, we should not be afraid to also abandon the current estimate or models for zeta n. We should not be afraid of that one and try to figure out an explanation why we don't have that. Interestingly, in the Moynihan book, they recommend that perhaps it is desirable to avoid using epsilon r. And they, they remind us that epsilon r was chosen exclusively for convenience. And the one, remember, Epsilon R has been developed by or proposed by Obukov, who was working with large oscillation. So he developed this Epsilon R to, to do a bit of calculations. So if we have this, this problem and we have to ad abandon the, 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 the estimates and the model of zeta n, what, what is left and what should we do? Well, I think perhaps it's time to, to rely on the equation of motion rather than a phenomenology argument, which have no connection or very little with the navier stokes equations, particularly since we have an equation, which is what we call the transport equation for <coughs> delta u. We have also transport equation for delta u cube and higher moment, if you can refer to L, which gives a list of all the transport equation for the different moment of the structure functions, then we have those equations. <coughs> and what, what, so this is, this one is for the third order structure function. And that one is for the third or third or second, sorry. This is the second order transport equation. And this is the third order <coughs> structure function transport equation. Now, what I'm be concentrating here today is on this equation here. This is again, I repeat, this is a common how the equation, but expressed in terms of the structure function. Again, this is the, what represents the transfer of energy. <coughs> this is the viscous term. This is the large scale contribution the, this energy budget, and this is the dissipation. So I'm going to spend time talking about that one. And as I said, we should rely more into this equation, so I'm going to work on that one. Now, dealing with this equation here, which is I rewrote it here, we're still dealing with what we call the problem of turbulence. If I want to solve this equation here, I end up with a problem, which is this one. This, this is what we call the, the closure problem. Okay, so I'm going to work on that, on that one and see how, how we're going to do that. But first, I rewrite this equation slightly differently in this form here. We'll see why in, in a minute. Where this term, by the way, I didn't mention, but this equation here is for the, <laughs> is the Kama Howe equation, which is for isotropic turbulence globally. Okay, and this is for decaying turbulence. Okay? It's not steady state equation, <laughs> the turbulence. So ZR, in this expression is given now by this relation here. And zeta is called force. I, I call it force in term just for convenience because we are going to do using DNS data where they use an artificial forcing to get a steady table. So I call it forcing, even though it's not strictly speaking the forcing term. But that forcing can be steady or non-steady and it can vary from floor to floor. More, more also it can, for a given turbulent flow, the force and can vary from region to region within the turbulent flow. You can imagine if you have a boundary layer, the forcing near the wall is going to be different from the one outside. Now, as long as the forcing is not steady, well, we cannot reach a steady state. And also, as long as this term is not zero, we cannot reach a universal <laughs> state for the <laughs> small scale turbulence. Okay. So, but as I said, <clears throat> we need to, if I want to solve this equation, we need to know how to close it, in other words, how to get a model for this, for the third order. So we've done this, we take a model for the third order structure function based on what we call a, a gradient tap with a viscosity formulation given as this form. Now, there have been already model based on gradient tap and a 
across the formulation, but they are different from the present one in, in, <laughs> in the sense that I do not propose a form for delta u squared. So let me <laughs> explain this. This is the model here, delta u, for the delta u squared, the edifice viscosity is represented by this one. Now, for the sake of argument, let's see, assume that we take k41 form for delta u squared. So this is that one. If I substitute now this expression into the model, I end up with this, okay? Now, since we know we have to satisfy the four fifth law, so we can see that you replace, <laughs> you can see that one now equals to this. <laughs> and that really makes sense. <laughs> it seems that the, this model will produce or is consistent with the K41 uh, theory. But so far, we, uh, the, the current consensus is that delta u square is rather given by this expression. So let I take this expression here, substitute it into this model, the same model, of course. And again, we must satisfy the fourth fifth law here. So we end up with this relation. Now, the only way this relation can be satisfied is by taking the exponent here, this one here, to zero. Again, if that's zero, we recover this term. So it seems that <laughs> the model I'm using here is, works regardless of either you have K41 or intermittency. And that makes sense because we know that the third order works for K41 or it's supposed to work for K41 and K62. So it makes sense that whatever you use, you end up with the same result, <laughs> okay? So having said that, now I've got my quick Kalman Howard equation. I'm gonna concentrate in the scale, in the range of scale beyond the dissipative range. So I'm scaling range and the large scale. So that's why I, I, I grade the viscous term. Now, I've got <laughs> my model. If I take this, now replaced by the actual model here, sub <laughs> substitute and integrate, and I end up with this expression for the delta u square, where br is given by this relation. So using Starting from Carmen Howard, modeling delta u cube, I end up with an expression, an analytical expression for delta u square, which is a model basically. And remember what when I talked about Obukov, a Kolmogorov, uh, K62, we have an expression like that where this term was an f. So in our case, f is represented by this expression. Now I'd like to show you this this table here where I, I will put on the right side, on the left side. The, what we call, I call rigorous results for the delta UQ. We know that one. So this is, there's no modeling here. This is what, exactly what they have. Now for the, for, for fun, if you prefer, I, I rewrite this, this form here, where I can I express this sort of pseudo dissipation here, epsilon, epsilon tilde R3, given by that one. I did it that way, so we can, uh, an echo of, um, of, uh, Landau's remark, which states that the dissipation it cannot be universal and it's going to change from floor to floor. So we can see that this epsilon R three will vary if you change the ZR. So, the, but this result is correct. Okay, this is a rigorous result. Now, let's take the mod the model for epsilon for the delta U cube and deduce the an expression for the second order stretch of function. And I call this semi-empirical result because I use a model for the delta U cube into the common Hardo equation. Having said that, I obtained this expression here. Okay. <clears throat> now, like, like here, I want to simply rewrite this equation so I can have an expression of this, of this form here. And again, I have another, another epsilon R2, which is quite different from that one and given by this relation. Again, shows you that if BR changes, epsilon R2 changes. Again, reminiscent of Landau <laughs> remark that dissipation will change with large scales. Now, one, one few remarks here. First, can we generalize this relation? So can I write delta u, n, delta <laughs> u to the power n in this form where I need to get an expression for epsilon r n, n and also an, an expression for zeta n. I'm not, I don't know if we can generalize or not. Mm. 
to see that we probably need to work out with the equation for the transport of delta u cube, delta four and delta five, et cetera, et cetera. The other remark is that if, since br in theory is related to zr, and if we have this, our four fifth law, then that means zr has to be zero. So if zr is zero, that has to go to be zero. And then we end up with this dissipation or pseudo dissipation equals to that one equal epsilon bar, and we recover the two-third law, okay? <laughs> so this is simple hand calculations. It show, perhaps shows us that how the large scales affect the, not only the four-fifth law, okay? And you, we, the only way you are going to get the four-fifth law is by getting zero here. Right? And if you can see that if you got zero, then you end up with the two-third law. Now, what I'll do, perhaps it's nice to test this, this relation. <laughs> so, scan, we've got the, our common Howard equation, where for the decaying HIT, and that's really the common Howard term. Right? This is what you get from the common Howard equation. Now, what you need to notice is that this term has a cumulative effect. The other term, ZR, this is what the one they use in direct numerical simulation of forced HIT so they can reach a steady state turbulence. And the term is given by this relation here, where we have F, F is a forcing, a spectral forcing, which is constant, some use constant of a range of low wave number, where of course the integral of this term here over the range <laughs> where it is applied is equal to dissipation. One important aspect is that this term is not a cumulative effect, it's just a local effect. For ZR, you, have, you can see it's quite different. Now you might expect that because you have difference here, you might end up with some difference in the result <laughs> from the common Howard equation. So what I, I've got here, I've got the DNS of force. I start with the force HIT, and there's no I repeat, there's no modeling here. <clears throat> so here we plot the val this value here divided by epsilon air, so you end up with 0.8 plus delta u cube divided by epsilon air. So we have the first case here, Reynolds number here is about, this is that one, 300. You've got then the uh, other, other different Reynolds number, so as you increase the Reynolds number, of course you increase the separation between small scale and the large scales. So you have this one is about, uh, she had about 100, 100 1100, then you've got another one here at uh, 1300, and then you have a, another one at 2200. Now, something happened on this one here, I don't know what it is, I, I don't know, I have to discuss perhaps with the people who've got their DNS data, but something is not quite right. Here. But still, so those are the DNS data, and the lines here, you can see, are simply this term <coughs> where the forcing the, the wavelength between which the forcing is done is given there. So I changed, you know, it has to change when you change your north <laughs> and here with the forcing. I try to mimic what I, I read on, on the on the papers when they use their forcing. Okay, it's not perfect, but I try to mimic. But anyway, the forcing is <laughs> seems to reflect properly with the Dennis data. You can see that when you have small separation, so this is gone. This is gone, so you have this term. So that term is equal to there, and this is what this represents here. And for large separation, again, this is has to be zero. This is zero, and then this must be equal to that one. And this is what you recover here. Okay. Now, if you take <clears throat> this term, you send it on the other side, you obtain the third order structure function, which is what I've done here. So I plotted here that this is the DNS data. So I scanned the DNS that I found in the literature for the third order structure function. You can see it here. And then there. Again, if you look at the one of the highest Reynolds number here, which is that one, seems to have some, some trouble here. Something happened here. And the line is simply <coughs> that term divided by epsilon r. So when you go to small separation, of course, this one <coughs> approach <laughs> zero, and then you end up with this. So this, when r is very small, you approach this quantity. And when r is big, because zr approach this quantity, it has to be zero. So it's 
behaving that way. And in other words, you can see that this term, and remember we, we, if we neglect that one, so it means that this term here reproduces more or less properly the behavior of the third order structure function. Okay, except this one here, I don't know what's happening here. All right, so that's, that's just to show you that <laughs> we can get, look at the balance, right? and that balance is satisfied by using this forcing. Now, I'd like to test the, the, the delta u square expression based on, of course, on the delta q model. So the, for, the expression is this one here. I use this constant here, more or less, from the, coming from, again from the DNS data, where br is given by this expression, and again, zr is given by this. So what I've got, I've, I plotted the, the second order structure function for the DNS data, for different ones we see before. Now, yeah, if you bear in me, you can see the, the little square here, those ones. And for this Reynolds number, they're sitting below the, the other one, where the solid line here is what I call the universal dissipative range. And you no know, evidence is that there is strong evidence that this, this range is universal. So I put it here. So what I've done, I simply try to correct the squares here by changing the adjusting the dissipation. And so that means the square are now replaced by the crosses. Maybe I can do this, you can see. See what I've done? So you can see the square here now, are replaced by the crosses. And now they sit in, on top of the others, all right? So this is just for <laughs> correcting and, and have, being able to compare them. Now, <laughs> the last, so this is the DNS data. And the lines, or solid lines, are simply this expression here. So for the lowest Reynolds number, you put it here, it goes there. And of course, because remember, this expression has been developed by neglecting the viscous term. So as the, as the separation drop, this one drops. So your delta u square approach to the law, which is what you have here. So all of them here collapse on the single line. By definition, it has to collapse. But what I like is that the, the model predicts relatively well the behavior in the sort of, if you can call it this a scaling range, and also the large scales. Quite interestingly. <laughs> now, then, so this is quite, to me, it shows that the, the, the model we use for the, this one is not too bad, right? Considering the, the relatively good results. What I've done further, I the previous figure, that one was simply this analytical expression. That one, what I've done there, I used the Kalman Harvard. So I'm gonna solve this equation using the model for the delta u cube. So what I've done, you substitute this model into here, and then you solve it for delta u square in best form. Now, when you do this, you simply need a, a boundary condition to start your calculation. So I start at r equals zero. And we know that when r equals zero, must have zero <laughs> for the delta u square. So doing that, and you can see what happened, and this is my calculations now here. Those are the same as before, the DNS data, so there's nothing changing. Here I just added two third law, but those are the new calculations coming from the, from the Kalman Howard equations. You can see it going there. So nothing's changing, it says before. If you, the difference is slightly in here. Let me go back to this one here. You can see here about 80, the lines deviate from the DNS. The lines are here while the DNS are there. Yeah. When we are, when we have R on eta, it has come over scale, it's about 80. So if we go here, you can see now we improve dramatically, 80 is about here, dramatically the collapse between the calculation based on the common Howard equation and the DNS. Now this has, it's not working because the model, here, this model is not meant to work in the dissipated range, okay? So this is interesting and this is quite nice that the model, simple model for the, for the third order structure function reproduce relatively well the DNS data. Although we might have to comment on what's happening in this region here, where the DNS data are sitting above the solution coming from the Kalman Howard equation. <clears throat> Just to illustrate that the calculations are 
the calculations are not too bad. <laughs> we have the viscous term, the, the viscosity or the viscous term yeah, here. You see the calculations. This is the DNS data. I plotted here the Z term, the forcing. And this is the DNS data obtained from the balance using the DNS data here. So there's a good agreement between the the Z term coming from the DNS data and the expression for the Z. You would expect that, of course. And also the good agreement between the, the DNS data for this term and the calculation. So it seems that the, <laughs> the model works relatively well and we're solving properly the common Harvard equation. However, this is where I've got a problem. It's this, when I plot the compensated second order structure function, you can see it here. So <laughs> we've got, then the solution coming from common how solution here there and there and this is the dns data here coming there and then you can see what happened with this one i added grid turbulency from by kaminsky and hall uh, but what i had to do i had to change the dissipation because if i used the data coming from this paper and i plot the structure function the normalized or the compensated structure function that way, the, the, the black cross will sit on the top. Here. And that thing's correct. So I correct it so to bring it down. But what is important here is not really the level, but is the shape of the of the curve. Now, why why the, the DNS gives me this overshoot while by solving the common Howard equation, I don't have the overshoot. So some might say, oh, well, it's because that tells you that the exponent is not two thirds, but something else, it may be a bigger. However, if we say so, then we have a problem here. So don't think that really reflect that the exponent zeta two is bigger than two. It reflects something else. And that something else, we can find out what it is. First, I show you calculation, recent calculation using a BQNN of a forced isotropic turbulence. And the Reynolds number you can see varies from 200 to 10 to the six. And see what happened when, and this is the force, okay, same forcing applied as <laughs> for the DNS data. You can see what happened when you increase the Reynolds number, and you can see you've got your overshoot. Well, I call it overshoot because I can't, don't know how to call it. So another shoot, and it reflects what we have. Here. So that's interesting. Now, why, why we have this? And I repeat, why by using Kalman Howard equation, I don't have it. It's not there. And I, I, although I'm using the same forcing, they use in the EDQNM and here. So I try to understand what's going on. Here. <laughs> so what, what I looked at is I calculate the way <laughs> the structure function using the spectrum, which is what they do, what we it is done in DQNM and also in the DNS. So they, once you've got your spectra or 3D spectrum, you can calculate the second order structure, second order structure function using this relation. So I say, okay, let's take simple spectrum, 3D spectrum. I use POMP because mm -hmm. <laughs> it seems to work relatively well. And to test it, I just took that spectrum here, converted it into 1D like that and compare with the classical grid turbulence. And we have the results. It's not too bad. Okay? It's not too bad. So I'm satisfied with this 3D dimension, 3D spectrum. It's not perfect, but it's enough to, to illustrate the case I want, I want to make it. Now, also what I do, I'm gonna put a forcing in that spectrum. Remember the DNS data, we have a spectral forcing in the, <laughs> to generate this uh, steady state turbulence. So basically, this is, what I, this is my forced spectrum. Now, it's not ideal, and the forcing is in the low range <laughs> of the wave numbers. Now, it's not perfect, but it's simple, no, it's simple, but it is enough to illustrate the effect of forcing on delta U when you use the calculations <laughs> based on the spectrum. And this is what we, we have here, of course, uh, now dealing with a forced spectrum. Now, the result, first, let me go through this curve. Here you have the unforced spectrum, the, the red one, a different Reynolds number. I just simply change the viscosity and you can see the variation of viscosity is quite huge. So we've got unforced spectrum here. And then I add my forcing and as expected, forcing affect the spectra 
in the low range of the <coughs> wave numbers. Now, with this spectrum, I calculate second order structure function, and we have it here, the, same, the color here corresponds to the same here. So you have the red one for the enforced, the lower Reynolds number, and you have another, this one also, which is an enforced. When you put the forcing, you can see the dramatic change you obtain here, particularly here, and also here, you are going to have this, I will show this overshoot. Now, this is comparable to what we can get with an ADQNM data, where the Reynolds number varies from 350 to 10 to the 5. Again, you have the structure function calculated with the enforced spectrum here, there, and there, while this one here is for the fourth one. And this is similar to that one. <laughs> well, I can only conclude one here is that the forcing affects the spectrum and the, <laughs> and the forcing then affects the, the, the structure function. Now, but more than that, the result tells me more than that, that the spectrum I'm using has no internal intermittency. So the deviation I observed on the two third law or the other shoot we had in the compensated third, second order structure function is not associated with a phenomenon of the internal intermediates, but associated with the fact that we have the forcing. Now that, that's fine, but again, I have a, another question here, or we had it, we saw it before, is why the Kalman Hauer solution does not capture the other shooting. And that's what I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out here. Well, perhaps some element of answer uh, in here is that Kalman Hauer equation is only for decaying. HIT and of HIT, in fact, it's global isotropy. So that's one thing. The other thing is that although we apply, if you apply the forcing, maybe that forcing is probably leading to non isotropic turbulence at large scales. And if it's not the case, then whatever you get from that forcing is not going to satisfy Kalman Howard because I repeat, Kalman Howard is only for HIT. Now, and I played around with a, uh, another forcing to see what, what, what happens. So we've got our common Howard equation, same as before. The only thing I, I did, instead of start, starting taking the boundary condition at r equals zero, I take it at some r where I know that the second order structure function follows this, this law. So there's no big deal. Otherwise, <laughs> you, this is just to improve slightly the, the, the dissipation range, but it doesn't affect the rest. We've got the forcing, the spectral forcing, and I'm also using now what we call the linear forcing uh, developed by Lundgren, which is given by this quantity. Now, again, you can see that this, this one here is more akin to the Kalman Howard equation because we have a cumulative effect. <clears throat> now, this is the spectral forcing, and this is the linear forcing. And here I <laughs> calculate a solve Kalman Howard equation, of course, the close one. We've got the, this, I put it here, the universal dissipative range here to have uh, some, some reference. You can see now we improved a little bit the result before we were going here. Now we improve a little bit more, but, and we have the result here. So we can see that we have the, the linear forcing, which is the blue, and we have the spectral forcing, which is sitting above that one. So see, we have two forcing, giving us different results on the thing. So it means that the forcing play a role <laughs> and perhaps explain why the DNS we have does not produce what, <laughs> what we expect it to be. Now, what I've done, I also compared with uh, some experiment here. So we have grid turbulence, uh, this Reynolds number. We have a axial axis symmetric jet. Uh, the Reynolds number is 400. Or oh, when I said the Reynolds number is the micro scale. Number and then we have the grid turbulency again by Kaminsky and Hall, where the Reynolds number is that, <laughs> that, that, that big basically. I plotted the <coughs> two third law here just for reference. Again, the blue are the linear forcing, and it fits relatively well. Then is that axis but here. And the red are the spectral forcing. And again, the spectral forcing is going to sit above the this linear forcing. In fact, it seems that the linear forcing reflects better the decaying turbulence than the, <laughs> of course, the, the 
the spectral forcing which has been done for the for the steady state or turbines. But still, we do not exceed to a third law, regardless of the forcing I'm using. Stretch of function sits below that line, green line. So this is <laughs> something is quite a puzzling. Uh, how what 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 can explain that? I think it's because uh, we we'll mention first. Let me have a look at this one. We've got spectral force, sin versus linear force. So it's again common how the equation for very large scales. We know we are going to have this. Z ha has to follow for four fifth epsilon r and the delta and the second stretch of function must be equal to two times <laughs> the variance. So spectral forcing here, if you take the right side for very large r, I don't know what it's going to give us. See, for some reason, this equation with this forcing does not tell me what's going to be the value the expression for the delta u square for some reason you can see it's, it's not included if i take the, the linear force in a given by this expression well you can <laughs> so because of that so we have this term is going to be equal to four fifth of epsilon r then you come to this point take the derivative and then you can see that this forcing force leads you to the right limit so is it is it possible that the this forcing allows some other form <laughs> For all of the value for delta u square, I'm, I'm not sure. But all I can say is that it's possible that the spectral forcing, although isotropic, uh, as used in the DNS of uh, 3D periodic tables, can generate some large scale anisotropy in the turbine flow. And after all, the box has a limited size. And generation of this anisotropic <laughs> uh, then engender or generate this overshoot. This is the way I explained this, this behavior. And according to what we have, this behavior is not reflected, does not reflect the, the, the internal intermittency because I can get the same behavior by taking a force uh, uh, spectrum where there's no intermittency, intermittency accounted within that spectrum. So that, that led me to my <laughs> conclusion, a conclusion answer, and I had a few questions. So did we get it wrong? I would be tempted to just say yes. Uh, uh, one reason why is we probably did not know the Reynolds number effect very well. So what we have missed, I guess we have missed the final Reynolds number effect. Uh, <coughs> we came to it relatively late. And how could we have missed it? Well, the theory has been tested against relatively low Reynolds number. And this, this then hides or misses the final Reynolds number effect. So this is what, what I think happened, or I believe that this is what happened in, in, over the last years or past decades with our theory about small scale turbulence. So what we can do, what can we do well? One thing as we saw here is to rely on the uh, equation of motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Try to work, although it's not simple, but <laughs> more reliable <laughs> equation of motion. If we want to do some phenomenology model, develop some model based on phenomenology arguments, we must assess their mathematical validity or basically reality. Actually, this is what we do really when we do uh, turbulence modeling. We assess that the turbulence model, your capsule model or SST model you use, that is realizable. In other words, it should not uh, lead to negative uh, kinetic energy. So we should, why, why we shouldn't do the same with models for the uh, exponents? And also we have to make sure that whatever model we have, it has to be consistent or comply with the equation of motion. Finally, and this is the, the I think the, the big one, is to try to get real Reynolds number uh, flow data, either DNS or measurements. When I say real flows, that is, and particularly on DNS, is rather than to focus on the grid and the box turbulence where we put a forcing which it seems that we don't control it why don't we try to simulate a jet flow and look at what happens in <laughs> on that flow so i know the reynolds number <laughs> is low but perhaps it's, it's, this is a way, way one way to do it and that concludes my talk thanks i hope i was in the in the in the limit okay <laughs>
That's, that's great. Thanks for the talk. And I open the floor for question. If you have any question, please unmute yourself and ask question. I might go first. About your JET data set, yes. what sort of Reynolds number? Well, for this one, yeah, this one, the Reynolds number was about 400. 400. Yeah, uh, Alanda. And it was incompressible jet, right? Yeah, yes, it's just a simple jet, yes. That was on the center line of the jets. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Any more questions? Hello? Yep. Hi. Oh, thanks for the talk, Professor. Uh, so in, in one of the slides, you had mentioned that uh, 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 Krishnan had mentioned that uh, once you abandon the idea of K41, the, yeah, there, yeah, is a, yeah. there is a big box of Yeah, there's you know, a box, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. And then your recommendation was to, you know, look at the Navier-Stokes mathematical characteristic as opposed to not delve on some ansatz that uh, yes. people have done in the past. <clears throat> so one of the things that you can check from the scaling exponents is that N over 3, where if you give uh, N equals 1, Yes. You get that velocity uh, deficit is uh, scales at one over three as the space, and uh, Onsager had, had uh, independently come up with uh, the K forty one theory by by just working on this uh, holder continuity of the mm -hmm. velocity fields, yeah, and, yeah. and the entire multi fractal uh, approach of turbulence has stemmed from this idea that the velocity is not regular. The fact that you have uh, Delta U scaling at R over one by three yes. uh, points to the possibility of singularities and so on. So, what would you, uh, uh, you know, uh, comment on the fact that you have on one side which which focuses on K forty one and the repercussions of K sixty two, yes. and on the other side which sort of says that K forty one is at its fundamental uh, basis not representing the actual kind of turbulence because people have studied that the velocity field is actually uh, multiple fractals rolled up into yeah, one yeah. big set, whereas K41 in its essence says <coughs> that the velocity field is a, a just monofractal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah would you? Well, would you come the, 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 again, we, we're coming back to the phenomenology argument, right? That's yeah. the, you're talking about the phenomenology argument. And I'm saying, let's get rid of the you know, phenomenology argument and let's stick to the equation. So if we stick with the equation, we cannot get it wrong. Mm, mm. And the equation seems to tell me that we are more likely to get. That and that one. Right. So the, this is this is the, one, the, the whole point that, that, that well, we need to really start working with the equation of motion because if you do the, the phenomenology argument, usually mm. those arguments are not connected to the Nadia Stokes equation, and that's a problem. To me, that's mm. a problem. Understood. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was my question because, you know, you, on the one hand, you, even though we are still sticking to the equations, the, yes. the, the answer to conjectures were, were, you know, obtained from the Euler equation, which assumes that, you know, the viscosity is not there in those scales yeah, which are yeah, 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 so yeah. far separated. Yeah. It's still connected to the equations of motion, but still it sort of, you know, is detached from the K41. Yeah, That's yeah. the part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, 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 every time when we say we, we, we take the viscosity zero, I have a concern because when you take the viscosity to zero, we're mm. not dealing with Navier Stokes anymore. Right, and we, right. have no, we have another problem. So I'm, 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 I'm staying away from the fact that, oh, let's take the viscosity to zero. No, I don't say we right. cannot take the viscosity to zero because if you look at turbulence in the real world, viscosity mm. is there. So I, I try mm -hmm. to stick to the real flow <laughs> rather mm -hmm. than the earlier mm. flows. Understood, yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Any more questions? If not, I guess we're going to thank you for <laughs> such a nice presentation and Thanks. hopefully seeing you in person soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too, yes. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Summer and wish everyone luck and have a lovely evening. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks Cheers. everyone again. Yeah. Thanks everyone to attending and listening to my talk. Eh? <laughs> Cheers. Bye. <laughs> Bye.
stop that. You, you, you stop it? Yeah, yeah I, 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 sorry, I didn't get this question in beforehand. It's Craig Bishop. I, I'm